I'm here today to talk to you about water quality and I'm going to talk to you pretty well the entire time about hard-headed science. But before I begin, I just want to briefly acknowledge that water is more than H2O, particularly for Māori. They have a strong spiritual connection with rivers. Ko ta ko ta ko ta I am the river, the river is me. That is how strong the identity is. But of course, for us, as some of, most of us as Pākehās here, um, we also often have strong relationships with particular rivers and lakes. Um, right, but now water quality, it's not simple. On the left, an adult whitebait. On the right, algae. A healthy, healthy water and unhealthy water. But it's a hot topic, it's a very polarised debate. Either everything is fine or we're going to hell, hell in a handbasket. And so I do want to look at the science and I do want to present something that is modulated that sits between those two extremes. So this is, a lot of this is fairly basic, so I apologise if it's too basic for some of you, but I wanted to build up a common understanding. Um, two main ways pollutants can get into water. End of pipe, and there's a pipe pouring nasty stuff into a river, uh, which we call point sources, and diffuse sources or non-point. Now, end of pipe are uh, easy to identify, and they're easily, relatively easily fixed, but that can be costly to fix them, or it is costly in many cases. Diffuse or non-point sources are invisible, they're hard to manage, it's about pollutants that are discharged over a wide area that find their way into water bodies via runoff and groundwater. So they're much more invisible, so you've got this contrast between the visible, identifiable, relatively fixable, and the diffuse, wide land area, invisible, very difficult to deal with. Okay, that's lesson number one. Number two, the big three pollutants that we need to worry about, and it's important to understand how they behave, where they come from, and what the differences are. Um, first of all, sediment coming from erosion. Um, secondly, bacteria coming from human and animal waste. And third thing, nutrients, in particular nitrogen, N and phosphorus, P, and I may in fact just talk about N and P at different times during this presentation. Notice how they're called excess nutrients, because nutrients are a good thing, they make plants grow, but excess nutrients, excess nutrients that get into water and make plants grow there cause trouble. And most of this talk I'm going to focus on those nutrients because that's where it's particularly important to understand the science, where it gets more subtle and complex. Um, it's very important to distinguish between N and P because there's diff oh no, very, sorry, very important to distinguish between these three things because they have different sources, different ways they travel to water, different techniques for reducing them. So just looking briefly at the impacts of the big three, there's sediment coming in uh, into the Waikato River after a flood, pretty obvious. Um, smothers the bed of the river, destroys habitat for fish and other animals, and importantly, carries pollutants with it, particularly pea, particularly phosphorus. Um, bacteria uh, obviously makes water unsafe for contact or drinking. And excess nutrients, N and P, can cause algal blooms and other weeds that choke the water bodies. Uh, so smothering the streams, depleting oxygen to low enough levels, dissolved oxygen in the water to kill the life in the water, and can produce poisonous toxins. And interestingly, the day before that photo was taken of that lake, which is in the Waikato, nine beef cattle died from drinking the water because some of the algae are seriously toxic. So I want to just run through first each of these three big uh, pollutants. Sediment first. Um, as I said, travelling in via erosion, hill country, uh, not planted, uh, that's where it's vulnerable. And the second uh, place is, of course, construction sites, which can be you know, urban or indeed rural, depending on where they are. Um, human, uh, direct human impact there. You get murky water, lose clarity, you get mud on the bottom instead of stones, which again uh, affects the health of the river. And importantly, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to keep repeating this because it's important to understand, it carries phosphorus in with it. Okay, bacteria um, stop doing their business directly in waterways. 
Um, here's a photo of someone actually doing the right thing with their dairy shed effluent. They're spraying it onto land rather than putting it in water, using it as fertilizer, but there's too much of it being put onto the land there. The grass can't take it up and grow, so you've got ponding happen happening. So an important thing about spraying effluent to land is that you need to do it properly, otherwise you don't get much further ahead. Um, we also have um, waste from freezing works, taking in bacteria, and uh, untreated or partly treated human effluent uh, sewage septic tanks. I was um, recently um, up in the Manawatu area and someone pointed across, the farmer pointed across the river to me at the, the green slime coming down from a septic tank from a house on a lifestyle block over the, over the water. So, you know, lots of different sources of these things. Excess nutrients, again, causing pest plants and algae. Now, a um, healthy river or lake is one with high levels of oxygen dissolved in it. When you get, I mentioned this briefly earlier, but when you get too many nutrients, um, you get a big dip in the oxygen content of the water overnight. And when that dip goes down, that's when you lose the biodiversity and the, the life in the river. So you actually get levels of oxygen cycling over the 24 hours, depending on uh, what's happening with photosynthesis and respiration. And you get this big dip in the night, which um, is really, what is particularly important to avoid. So I'm going to go on talking in some detail now about these two nutrients, the N and the P. Um, so looking particularly at the diffuse or the non-point sources of N, of nitrogen, because there's very little nitrogen that gets into water that comes from the end of pipe point sources, probably about 5% of the nitrogen that goes into uh, rivers um, and indeed groundwater, uh, comes from end of pipe sources. So almost all of it, 95% from diffuse non-point sources. And uh, up the axis there, kilograms of N per hectare per year. These are national averages. Forest, whether it's native or exotic, pretty well the same thing. Uh, sheep and beef farms, they're averaged together there. Dairy is considerably higher but not the 10 times higher you might think from some of the uh, things that are around in the media. And highest of all is horticulture and cropping, and that's because, of course, there's a lot of fertilizer used on those. But um, the, the, this is per hectare, and of course, nationally, we don't have um, hugely large areas that are um, in horticultural crops. There is a very basic problem with nitrogen, and this is why it's important to understand the science, and that's because in the form in which it's appearing here, it's in this uh, compounds called nitrates, and they're extremely soluble. And so this land just leaks the nitrates out the bottom like a sieve, and it gets into groundwater, and then it finds its way into the water body. So, if, so simple fact, if nitrates weren't highly soluble as they are, things would be very different, and we would have much less of a problem. So that's just really bad luck with the chemistry. Um, now let's look at the, where the excess nitrate comes from, nitrogen comes from on dairy farms. Important to understand that just about all of it, the great majority actually comes from urine. And um, that's hard to manage. Um, you get the urine patches, of course, and the problem is it's a very concentrated application of urine in patches, and it's too much at once, generally, for the grass to use and take up and grow. Um, this problem uh, is much worse, much the worst in winter when the soil is wet and the grass isn't growing or hardly growing at all. So it's not, not good at taking up the nitrate. So another fact here is that the problem varies very much over the year. 